Good evening, everyone. I'm Pastor Dave. This is a program called Grace Life Unleashed Podcast with Pastor Dave and friends playing chess in a checkers world. If it seems like I'm getting better at this, it's probably because this is the second time I'm doing this one over. I had no audio for some reason, so we're going to do this one with audio this time. As you guys can read lips. Um, anyways, I'm Pastor Dave. Uh, it's playing chess in a checkers world. And uh, if you don't think things are getting more checkery and chess as time goes on, um, it, it seems like you got to think three or four steps ahead to really understand what's going on in this world right now. And it, it's getting more and more complicated as things are unraveling. Um, again, I'm Pastor Dave. This is Brian Bible Church, Grace Life Church. We're located in Evansville, Indiana. And our P.O. Box is Box 6033. If you could help us out with a gift, we'd really appreciate it. It takes, it takes money to run these things and um, expenses go on. And I hope we're helpful to you and you can give something back to us. And my phone number is on the bottom there. Um, if you got a question, comment, uh, agree, disagree, it doesn't matter. Um, send it to me. And we'll go from there. Um, there's a lot of places you can get a hold of us. Um, GraceLifeUnleashed.com is our website. Um, Grace Life Unleashed by Dave Sigmund is our YouTube site. Facebook is Grace Life Church and or Brian Bible Church. One or the other or both will take you there. And the website and Facebook link you back to YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, please subscribe. Um, and then click that little alarm bell and um, you'll get a notice every time uh, I put a new video up, which is twice a week. We do Sunday. And then we do Wednesday, and, and the purpose of Wednesday is to take grace, the doctrine of grace, and then apply it to our daily lives. And as the world starts to unravel, and if you follow current events, uh, we just had a bank that went belly up here in America, and there's one in Europe going belly up. And it, and at first, all the depositors over, was it 150000 or 250000 whatever the FDIC uh, number was they weren't going to be covered and then they decided to cover everyone um, and the question is where did that money come from well guess what it was printed out of thin air and this is going to create more and more inflation now whether that's a sign that the Fed is you know printing money again I don't know you, you tell me our rule again is don't get dead and what I mean by that is you look at the life of the Apostle Paul and, and Paul was not the guy that was on the front line uh, doing protests. He wasn't the guy that was, you know, over, trying to overthrow the government. He wasn't plotting to assassinate people. He was trying to live under the radar. And I really, truly believe that we as grace believers need to live under the radar. I mean, like, well, what verses are you using for that? Yeah, take that thought. This is my coffee. I add a lot of milk to it, in case you're wondering. I do not like the taste of black coffee, so I dilute it with milk. Paul in 1 Timothy chapter uh, 2 says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. Now, again, Paul says all, and all does mean all. But then he gets a little more specific, and he says, for kings and for all that are in authority. Now, again, well, why? This is our goal, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. So what does God want? He wants us to live a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. And, and to me, that means we're living under the radar, okay? We're, we're not the person in the front of the line saying, you know, down with the government, let's, you know, overthrow this thing and start over again. Not, not that it's not a bad idea to, to burn to the ground and start over, but that's not our job. This is not our world. This is Satan's world. We're here to lead people to Christ and not to take it over, okay? For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. And in verse 4 says, who will have all men be saved? What's God's will? All men be saved. Now, will all men be saved? No. But God's will is that all men be saved. In fact, when Christ died on the cross, he died on the cross for all men. Everybody is savable. Now again, granted, everybody's not going to be saved. But everybody's savable. Christ's death, Christ's burial, Christ's resurrection covers everyone, even the lost. They have to believe, and then it's applied to them. Who will have all men to be saved and come unto knowledge of the truth? Again, what's God's will? All men be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. And Paul explains that a little more. He says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, that's Jesus Christ. So the, the way we're going to accomplish the salvation thing is through Christ. 
And what did Christ do? Verse 6, he gave himself as a ransom for all and to testify in due time. Wherefore, I'm ordained a preacher and an apostle. I speak the truth in Christ and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul is our apostle, and he is our, I guess, our rule giver, and we follow him, okay? Uh, I will therefore that all men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. So again, the issue is we're under the radar, we're not the guys doing the protests, and we're trying to live peaceable in a sin-cursed world, among sin-cursed people, in a sin-cursed environment, and at times it can be difficult. Years back, um, Lori was, was struggling with some things, and, and I was giving her some Bible verses, and um, I, I tend to do that sometimes as I, um, I have Bible study with people in emergency rooms, I guess you could say. And I was wrong. And what she said to me was just tell me what to do. And I, I struggled with that. Um, this happened probably, I don't know, 20 years ago. And, and I'm first using it now because it's just such a good example now. Um, when somebody is drowning, you don't give them swimming lessons, okay? You, you throw them something. You, 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 you throw them a life preserver. You, you throw them a, you know, a, a long pole. You, you, you throw them a life jacket. You throw them something that they can grab onto. And then when you get them out of the water, you say, you know what? We need to take swimming lessons so that this doesn't happen again. And when somebody's hurting, you know, whether it be spiritually or physically even, um, it's not a time to, to, in a sense, have a Bible study. It, it's a time to just help them and then get them back on their feet and then have the Bible study so it doesn't happen again. So we're taking these things that, that we're doing and we're trying to help you um, basically come alongside you. And for some of you, we're going to hold your hand and get you back on your feet and, and get you pointed in the right direction. And if, if someone looks like this when they're telling you what to do and they have a Bible in their hand or hit you in the head with it, I'd, I'd say run away from them. Okay. Now, in Galatians 6 is where we get our marching orders from, okay? Paul says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in the fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such as one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Now, again, the issue here is um, somebody has a fault. Okay, now, again, we, we're all faulted on some level. All of us are dysfunctional on a certain level. Um, growing up, my mom was in charge of cleaning out cars. I'm talking when we were little kids, okay? You know, when kids leave junk in the cars, whether they be, you know, clothes or food or whatever it is, somebody's got to clean it out once in a while. Somebody's got to either, you know, grab the vacuum cleaner and uh, the bucket and wash it at home or go take it to the car wash and wash it or run it through the car wash. But either way, someone's in charge. And growing up, my mom was always the one who took care of the cars. And growing up, Lori's dad always did. So we get married. And uh, she's thinking that I'm going to take care of keeping the car clean. And uh, I'm thinking she's going to. And between the two of us, nobody took care of it. So the car never got cleaned out. And, and again, I don't remember having a discussion with her. But it's one of those things where normal is what normal knows. And going into the situation, I didn't even realize that um, I could be wrong or that she could be wrong. Uh, I don't know who ended up being wrong. Um, but maybe we both did it together. Um, but there are situations to where there are people we're going to work with that have flaws because of, of the way they were raised. Um, things that have happened to them, uh, some of their own fault, some of them not their own fault. And sometimes we have to get that baggage and we have to debag them and get it out of them so that they can learn to live life on their own. So, you know, before we start picking on other, everybody, we too have faults. Okay. Um, you know, Paul says, you know, Restore such as one of the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. So what Paul is saying there is, hey, you're gonna have, you have issues too, just so you know. Maybe it's not that issue. And if you don't know what your flaws are, ask your friends, and they'll be very helpful in telling you, okay? And then Paul says what we're going to do, we're going to bear you one another's burden. So when somebody is in a fault, okay, then we who are spiritual are going to bear their burdens with them. We're going to go alongside them. We're going to, you know, clean them up, pick them up. We're going to dust them off, and we're going to get them back on their feet again. We're going to sense we're going to teach them how to swim. We're going to have a Bible study with them. We're going to, you know, get them to the point to where this doesn't happen again. You know, I don't know what, you know, any other illustration you want to use, but again, we, we cleaned them up, and now we're going to restore them and put them back together again. But this time we're going to put them back together so they can, you know, take care of it on their own next time or it never will happen again. 
If a man think himself, verse 3, to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. And then verse 4 says, but let every man prove, and the word prove there means show his own work. So we go from going alongside somebody and helping them to eventually letting them go and letting them do it on their own, because that's the goal. God wants people to be independent and to do things on their own. They don't want us to be, you know, slaves to someone else. And so when someone's having a struggle, we at times have to come alongside of them and, you know, pluck them out of the water and, and teach them how to swim. And then once they know how to swim, we put them back in the water and they can swim on their own now. Um, that's the goal. So every man's going to prove his own work and then shall we have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. And then verse 5 is what we're after. For every man shall bear his own burdens. It almost looks like verse 2 and verse 5 are opposite, and that's because they are. There's a time when you go alongside somebody and you help them, and there's a time when you hopefully let them go and let them get back on their own. So that's the process we have to do. And again, this takes time. And the definition of being spiritual, and I know it's like, no, spiritual pastor is when you know your Bible backwards and forwards. Uh, no. Spiritual is when you care about others. That's Paul's definition of spiritual. Granted, knowing your Bible helps. I understand that. But you, carnal is selfish, all I care about is myself, and spiritual is others-orientated. And God's goal is that we become others-orientated. And basically, we learn how to get along. And once in a while, that means just letting stuff alone, okay? Now, when it comes to the, the world we live in, and, and the economy we live in, things are unraveling pretty quick. You know, we've had uh, bank defaults this week. Uh, the stock market doesn't know whether it wants to go up or down. And trust me, it's going to go down, and then it's going to go up. And then it's going to go down, and then it's going to go up. Okay, be aware of that. That's what it's going to do. And eventually, when it's all said and done, we're going to have at least a 50% correction, maybe more. But I, I believe we're going to have at least a 50% correction at some point. And then it's going to diddle daddle around uh, up and down, up and down, and up and down. And I don't know how long it will be before we get back up to well, 4,000 again on uh, S&P 500. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but what I see over the next few months and the next few years is is kind of scary. And if we don't do some things to prepare for it, we're going to be one of those people who are in a fault. Again, the majority of the decline in a bear market occurs after the Fed's pivot. And in case you're wondering, the Fed is not pivoted. They're talking about maybe stopping. A stop is not a pivot. Um, the two-year bond interest rate has actually gone higher than the Fed rate, or lower than the Fed rate which means technically the Fed has done its job. Um, so I think they're going to not do any interest rate this month. Again, I'm not a profit. They're going to say, we're going to wait. And the reason they're waiting is because what happens is the interest rates fell a little bit on the two-year bonds. And so the Fed rate is actually higher than the bond rate. And so the Fed needs to either you know, go lower or go higher again. And so that gives the Federal Reserve um, a chance to start a little bit and hopefully let the bond market cool off a little bit until the banks aren't going to fall apart anymore. Uh, if you go back and study the, the Great Depression in 1929, 1932, what, what caused the Great Depression was not the stock market crashing, although the stock market did crash. Um, what caused the stock market to crash was the bond market crash, and, and we're looking for exactly at the same exact thing. History does not, you know, in a sense, repeat itself, but it, it, it sure rhymes a lot, and so be aware of what's going on. Again, from the drop of the stock market in 1929, it didn't get back up to even again until 25 years later. And I don't know if we're in that cycle right now. I think we are. But the most important thing is, you know, right now we have the stock market that's basically up to 4,000 on the S&P 500. It's very possible in this next raise, and especially when the Fed pivots and everybody thinks they're going to front run it, we might actually make new highs. And everybody's going to be like, oh, happy days are here again. And uh, that's the complacency before everything starts to just fall apart on us. And uh, we get to the bottom where you're angry and you're panicky and you're depressed. And then we hit bottom when finally everybody goes, I can't be in the stock market. It doesn't work. Be aware of that. I, I want to hold your hand. I, I am doing this for one reason and one reason alone, and that's because I want to help people. I mean, like, well, Dave, you're wrong. Then I'm wrong. I don't believe I am. So far, everything I said, from a you know, big standpoint, I mean, I can't call up or down. I can't call high or low, and I'm not trying to. Sometimes I give you an idea of what I'm thinking. You know, like I said, I think we're going to hit a high now, and we're going to go down. 
we're probably going to go down to 3,000 on the S&P, and then we're going to jump up probably into the fours. I don't know if that's going to be when everybody's going to front run the Fed. I'm not sure. And then we're going to go down. Um, the stock market does not just go down. It goes down, and then it goes up, and then it goes down, and it goes up and down and up and down and up. And you lean, learn, learn how to play those swings, and you'll be all right. Um, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.10, Now I beseech you, brethren, and that's that grace word, beseech. By the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that to be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. And that Paul's saying is, you guys need to get along. Okay, that's what he's saying. He's not saying you have to agree on everything. He's saying, but you got to agree on the big things. Okay, you got to be on the same page. You can't be at each other's throats. And that means sometimes somebody has to, like, I guess, let it alone. Most things are not worth fighting over. Leave it alone. Who cares? Who really cares? Okay. And a lot of times when people are selfish, they care about things that it doesn't even matter. Let somebody else make the decision. I don't care. I really don't care. Um, For it has been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Okay. So Paul's like, hey, you guys aren't getting along. And Paul was upset about that. He, he didn't like that. And this is what he says. Now, this I say that every one of you saith, I am Paul, I am Apollos, I am Cephas, and I have Christ. They were, they were following different leaders. You know, I like following Paul the best. I like following Apollos the best. I like following Cephas, which is Peter. Well, I just follow Christ. And I've seen, you know, great people who follow certain pastors and things like that. Every, every pastor has his, his, his strong points and every pastor has his weak points. Um, a lot of times we like certain personalities, and that's fine. Um, I have no problem with that, but don't think just because you like someone that he's the best. Learn to get along. Learn to glean things and, and enjoy every different type and style. Is Christ divided? The answer to that is no. Was Paul crucified for you? The answer to that is no. Were you baptized in the name of Paul? The answer is no. And uh, Paul here is going to talk about water baptism. The, the Corinthian church had a lot of kingdom saints in it. And as Paul went into the synagogue, he took a lot of uh, kingdom saints that weren't saved because they were still looking for the Messiah, taught him who Christ was, and then they were baptized into the kingdom church, which was water. And, and so I think Paul was involved in a lot of baptisms in the sense that he told these people they had to be baptized. They had to be water baptized because the kingdom doctrine is faith plus works, and the works were circumcision and water baptism and obeying the law. And uh, most of them were circumcised. That wasn't an issue. But when Paul runs into Timothy, uh, Timothy wasn't circumcised because his dad was not a Jew, and I don't think his dad wanted it done to him. And so the first thing Paul does is get some circumcised. And it's like, why? Well, Paul, Timothy was part of the kingdom program who was helping Paul teach grace. I have a problem with that. Or on the other hand, Titus, he was a, a full-grown um, you know, Gentile, and, and Paul had no desire to be circumcised. Well, why was he so adamant about Timothy? Because Timothy was part of the kingdom program. And the same thing he ran to people who weren't water baptized. Um, he had them water baptized, and that would include probably most of the people in that Corinthian church because they were not part of the kingdom program. When Paul ran into them. They were in the synagogue, but they were still looking for their Messiah. Paul teaches them who Christ was. Uh, the leadership gets mad, kicks him out of the synagogue. Paul goes right next door, starts a, a kingdom slash grace church, and I think every one of those um, kingdom saints had to be water baptized. They already were circumcised because people did that one, you know, without thinking. But when it came to water baptism, that was part of the new program um, with Christ. And so I think those people were water baptized, and they were like bragging, hey, you know, Paul actually did my baptism. That's so cool, okay? Uh, Paul says, lest any should say that I was baptized in my own name. You know, Paul says, who cares who baptized you? That's not even the point. And, and I know people who, when I was at my church in Altoona, Pennsylvania, one of the last things that Henry Culp gave up was water baptism. And one guy was always running around telling me how he was the last person that Henry Culp water baptized. And I'm like, who cares? It wasn't for today. He goes, I know. But he was the last person. He was proud of that. And I'm like, get over it. You know, I didn't say that to him, but I felt like it. Okay. And he says, and I baptize also the house of Stephanaeus. Besides, I know not whether I baptize any of you. Paul's like, it's not about me. <laughs> if he did the baptism, who cares? And then he says in verse 17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved is the power of God. Okay, so Paul says, Get over the, who cares about the baptism? What we're going to worry about here is the gospel, and we're going to worry about the cross of Christ, because that's the issue. The fight is not over who baptized you. 
the fight is over. Jesus Christ in his cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And then Paul says in verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Folks, the unsaved people think that the stuff we believe is a bunch of foolishness, okay? But unto us, it's which are saved, it's the power of God. The death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the most important thing you could ever understand. But to the world, it's just a joke. So, so be aware of that as you talk to people that our emphasis is in Christ. Now we jump to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And Paul's going to go through a series here of things that I think are so important. He's going to keep us pointed in the right direction. He said, for the love of Christ constraineth us. In other words, the number one reason we do what we do is because of the love of Christ. Now, why is that? Because Christ loved us so much that he died on the cross for our sins. So this is our way of giving back. That, that, that compels us. It's Christ's love, God's love through Christ, okay? If one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. So again, Christ died for us. The least we could do is live for him. Christ took our place, our punishment. That should have been us. And now out of an attitude of gratitude, we're giving back to God through Christ. In other words, by donating or giving of ourselves back. You know, we, Paul says we're a living sacrifice. We're not dead. We're still alive. And the problem with living sacrifices is kind of a joke is they keep crawling off the altar because their will gets involved. When a, uh, you give a sacrifice to the priest and he kills it, it's a dead sacrifice. They don't crawl off. It's, it's done. We are still alive. Uh, we still have will. A dead animal doesn't have a will. We as humans have a will because we're still alive, but we should be as though, I guess you could say we're dead. You know, Paul says, the least we could do, you know, is be a living sacrifice. That's the least. You know, I mean, that's not even going above and beyond. Now, Paul makes a comment in Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. He says, uh, wherefore, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. Now, he, where he's going with this is he's going to talk about Christ when he walked the earth. And he says, um, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, henceforth, know him no more. The reason Christ, Paul says that is because we don't follow Christ in, in his, his teaching in the sense of what he taught, because Christ taught the law. And that's why Paul says, you know, we, we, we don't follow Christ after the flesh. Now, we do follow Christ in character, okay, his morals, ethics, and values. We, we follow that. We don't follow what he taught in regards to the law. We're, we're not putting ourselves back under the law because Christ lived under the law. That, that's not what, how we follow Christ. We follow Christ in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But we do follow Christ in his character, okay? That's why Paul makes this emphasis here, though we have known Christ, yet now henceforth know we him no more. We're not following Christ under the law. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. So as a member of the body of Christ, we're, we're in a new creature, a new creation. We become a member of the body, not a member of the kingdom, okay? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Old man died. New man lives. We're in Christ. We're not in Adam. And we now live free from the law. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, this is an issue here, okay? Christ and God and man need to be reconciled to each other, okay? Now, the, the, the issue of separation, you know, where, what was the problem? Because when two people are fighting, people say, you need you guys need to reconcile. You need to get over your problems and get along. All right, so we have two groups of people here. We have... God on one hand, the man on the other. Well, what's the issue? Sin. All right, so how did God fix the sin problem between man and himself? Christ took our place, our punishment, and the sins were paid for. At that point, we were reconciled back to God. The issue was done. Okay, so God did his part. His part. He died for the sins of the world. Everybody's sins were reconciled. But that doesn't mean you're saved, because now you have to reconcile yourself to God. You have to do your part, which is what believe. So just because Christ died on the cross for the entire world doesn't mean the entire world is saved. It just means they're savable. We now have to take that message of salvation, Christ's death, his burial, and resurrection, to the world, have the world reconcile themselves to God, and then as, as Floyd Baker said, we have, you know, uh, we, we have you know, a sense that we're all getting along, and we have, I can't think of the word right now, um, plipiation, or whatever that word is. Um, and so we have reconcile in its completed form. And that's the important thing, okay? So God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. So 
God did his part. He paid for our sins. So now our sins are not imputed unto us, and he's committed unto us the word of reconciliation. So now we take that message that Christ paid for our sins, take it to man, and then they get reconciled to God on the other half, and so now both sides are reconciled. And then we're done. Now we're saved. Okay? Just because Christ died for everybody's sins doesn't mean everybody's saved. It means they're savable. Now we have to believe it, and then we have the other half, and now both halves have reconciled. Okay? And at that moment, we now are an ambassador for Christ. Paul says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador represents another country. Remember, we're a new creature in Christ. We're now part of heaven. We're now a heavenly ambassador to the earth. And Paul says, as though God did beseech you, God's begging us. We pray you in Christ's stead. We are here instead of Jesus Christ. Paul's begging us to what? Be reconciled to God. Get saved. You want to know what's most important to God? Getting saved. How is he going to do that? Through with his ambassadors. Who are ambassadors? We are. How do you get somebody saved? You tell them that Christ died on the cross, they believe it, and they're saved. How do you get them to believe it, Pastor? Well, they have to disbelieve it on their own. You can't make them. It takes time sometimes. For he hath made him, verse 21, to be sin for us, that's Christ, who knew no sin, that's Christ, that we, the body of Christ, might be made the righteousness of God in him. The reason we're saved is because we've been declared just as righteous as Jesus Christ himself at the moment of salvation. Having your sins forgiven does not save you. Being declared righteous does. You see, if somebody is not a saved person, they don't have God's righteousness. They only have their own righteousness, or we're going to say their own good works. So when they stand before God at the, the great white throne judgment, they're going to present their good works to God, and they're not good enough. You need to be declared just as righteous as God himself. And it's, it's not that difficult, but that's what's going on. So as we, you know, get up in the morning, as we go through these next months, and I think it's going to get rough. I really do. I think it's going to get rough. And uh, I've asked the people in my church to, you know, get some extra food. I, I told them over a year ago to get their money out of the bank. People, what's wrong with the banks? Banks are fine. Banks are, they're, they're stable. All right, we just saw one fail in Europe. We saw one fail in America. There's going to be more that are going to fail. You know, this is a bond issue. Uh, if you have your money in a bank, you could possibly lose it all. Oh, the government will bail them out. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. I, the government doesn't have enough money to bail every bank out. And I think we've just seen the tip of the iceberg in regard to this bond market. Again, what crashed the stock market back in 1929 was not the stock market. It was the bond market pulling the stock market down. So we're, we're doing the same thing over again. We didn't learn from our mistakes. The history doesn't repeat itself. It kind of rhymes. And we're kind of doing the same thing over again. I don't know how this ends. I don't know if we're going to have a soft landing. I don't know if we're going to have a hard landing. Everything I see is this is going to be a hard landing. Even if I'm wrong, if you have extra food in your pantry, you can eat that, you know. They say food's going to keep going up. So you can eat that, all right? Um, canned goods keep, um, you know, I'm not saying buy a bunch of milk and put it in your refrigerator. I'm saying buy stuff that keeps and just have in case we have some rough times. Nothing wrong with being prepared. You know, when, when somebody is um, drowning, we can't jump in and save them. Because if you jump in and save them, well, what happens is they grab onto you because they're drowning and you both drowned. Okay. If this economy crashes and burns, um, we can't save everyone. And that's why I'm, I'm trying to get you to, to get your ducks in order now and to just basically be able to, in a sense, you know, take care of yourself so that we're not a burden on the system. We're not a burden on each other. And just doing a few simple things right now, I think will help us get through these next couple months, next couple of years. I hope things are not as bad as I'm concerned they might be. I, I hope I'm totally overblown this. But there's nothing wrong with being prepared for anything, okay? Um, when I lived in Florida, um, the issue was hurricanes. You had to have food on hand. And there was that one time when uh, hurricane came through that all the power was basically off for about five days um, and so things were bad and not that it was the end of the world but for five days you just basically couldn't do anything until they got things taken care of and and so that's just how life is um, if, if we have some issues here in America with certain things um, hey if you're prepared that's fine I, I tell people right now don't buy big ticket items let's not be buying houses right now wouldn't you like to buy your house for 50% off I don't want to sell it for 50%. Okay. Uh, then don't be buying one either. Wait until they're on sale. 
I really like a good sale. How about a used car, 50% off? I think we're going to get to that on both of these. Um, unfortunately, I think the stock market is going to be on sale, too, at 50% off. Um, the economy is going to be on sale for 50% off. Um, it's During the Great Depression, um, the price of everything went down, but no one had any money, so it didn't matter. And we had to reset. Um, right now, things are high. And, you know, stagnation or... or Deflation is fine as long as people have money, you know, but when once things settle down and we get the reset, you know, you might have gasoline for a, a buck a gallon again. I don't know, but I'll guarantee you're not going to be making 25 bucks an hour if gasoline is a dollar a gallon. Everything's going to be reset. Um, so be aware. Uh, I, I tell people I think you should have a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver, um, just in case. Uh, I wouldn't be keeping all my money in the bank. Be like, Dave, I don't have any money. Well, then don't worry about it. You're fine. Um, I think everybody should have a second job, a side hustle, learn some skills, whatever the case may be, um, and keep busy. That's the key. Uh, Everything is going to be fine. We need each other. We have each other. But just prepare a little bit. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm trying to get you to prepare a little bit. We as Americans probably are the worst preparers out there. We don't anticipate anything. And then I'm trying to push you through the door a little bit here and get you to prepare a little bit. So let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for salvation. Lord Christ died on the cross for our sins, and we, we thank you for that. He was buried, and he, he, he rose again. And, and Lord, that's love. Uh, there's nothing, nothing better than that love, and we thank you for that. We ask now, Lord, as we prepare for life, the good, the bad, the ugly, we pray that we can use our brains. Lord, you've asked us to, to think, that we can plan. We, we can plot in the sense of, of trying to figure out how to do things correctly. And Lord, we can just talk to others about Christ. Now, we're ambassadors for salvation, to help people live eternity in heaven. And we pray, Lord, we can do a good job as your ambassadors. And we pray this in your name. Amen.